What Excuse do we me. ascribe the gain, the, that increase in gain? All right. Cold fusion remains a mystery. There are about half a dozen theories that might explain it, or more, actually. There are some very good theorists working on this. Nobel laureate Julian Schwinger, Professor Peter Hagelstein at MIT, Giuliano Preparata in Italy. There seems to be some kind of mechanism whereby in the palladium or the nickel, on the surface or inside, the nuclei of the reactants do undergo some kinds of nuclear transformations. We know this because we see a faint level of nuclear ash. But we don't see, regrettably, the final total addition of materials, of ash, that's needed to explain it all. That's a mystery still. You're saying then, and you anticipated my next question, <laughs> that because my next question was going to be, are we talking a chemical process or are we Absolutely talking a, a, uh, right. uh, a, a nuclear process? Talking a nuclear process or something equivalent to a nuclear process. Let's be precise about that. Okay. Because the energy out is so far beyond what a chemical reaction could produce that it can't be chemistry. If I were to buy a small uh, AA battery and tell you that from that AA battery, I could get my 4,000 pound car going at 140 miles per hour into a wall and release that kind of energy, you'd be shocked. Well, cold fusion can do things like that and more. Because I seem to recall that, <coughs> that, one, that one of the, that people were uh, disregarding it out of hand because they were saying that the reaction isn't nuclear, therefore it isn't real. Okay. They said, if you can't explain it, if you can't tell us exactly how it works now, on day one, or in year two, or in year four even now, then it must be a figment of your imagination. In fact, they began to use a term of what I would call scientific bigotry, pathological science. It is called pathological science by those who wish, wish to disparage it, namely something that people are chasing after that's evanescent and doesn't exist, and they're fooling themselves. Well, the fountain of youth. The fountain of youth. Are the Japanese fooling themselves when the Japanese Ministry of International Trade and Industry invests 3 billion yen in this? And Japanese companies ranging from Toyota to Toshiba and uh, Mitsubishi and so forth and so on invest money in this? Absolutely not. This is serious science. And the only place where it's not serious is in the headquarters of the United States Department of Energy. So we have, at one point, we, we can measure the success of this on the basis of its heat output. Yes. Two, we don't know exactly how it works. But then again, I, I sort of visualize the scientists of the 17th and 18th century. Right. Never mind that. I can sort of visualize a guy standing out in the wood and the moon's coming up. And he can't explain why the moon's coming up. So therefore, obviously, it's not coming up. Interesting observation. Galileo, as you know, was persecuted for showing the church fathers views of the uh, craters of the moon and the mountains of the moon and the spots on the sun and the moons of Jupiter. I recently heard a quote from one of the church fathers who said of the moons of Jupiter that Galileo could see in his telescope. He said, since they cannot be seen by the naked eye, therefore they cannot influence the Earth, therefore they're not important, and therefore they do not exist. OK? And that is almost the way cold fusion has been treated in the 20th century. Do we want to look at this chart? This is an interesting chart uh, of the problem as we uh, conceive of it today, the controversy as we conceive of it today. It ranges from the bottom here, which I hope we can focus on, the bottom Namely, pathological science. There's no evidence for cold fusion. It does not exist. It is an imaginary problem. To this level, low-level nuclear products are seen and accepted. There are people who accept those. And heat only, excess heat, that is heat more than the power, electrical power being put into the cell, is being observed. 
So some people like to see this or that. Then some people see this problem. They see, OK, they both exist. There's heat, and there are some nuclear products. But they're not related to one another. The nuclear products, what are you referring to as the ash? Tritium, low-level products that are not completely explaining the total reaction by conventional theory. Mm -hmm. This is the way I think it should be looked at. This is the way Japan is looking at it, and the way most serious scientists are looking at it. It's a unified problem. The heat output is connected with the nuclear products that are there. Nuclear products, by the way, in chemical systems are not supposed to be seen. And this is what is the, the conundrum that we're in. It is a gigantic paradigm shift. It is the complete violation of the wall that separates nuclear physics, which we normally think of as high energy, and chemist chemistry. I notice we have a uh, cell over there. Could you describe how that works? Well, this cell is just a mock-up cell, you might say, a dummy cell that was used initially in some experiments that were done here in Bow, New Hampshire, very low expense. I call this our $5,000 nuclear reactor, actually. Uh, we demonstrated, we did not demonstrate excess heat with this. This is the same cell that Professor Takahashi at the University of Osaka University got tremendous excess heat out of, okay, with a certain type of palladium and heavy water. It's also the same kind of cell, generically, that, right uh, on the table. that Professor or Dr. Uh, Edmund Storms at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States got excess heat, and others have gotten it, too. We proved, however, that indeed Professor Takahashi had what he said he had, not by ourselves getting it, because it was only a shoestring operation. It lasted a few months. We then transferred our equipment, which is like this, similar to this, to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. There is a lab there that's very interested in cold fusion, Professor Hagelstein's lab. What we see in here is the cooling coil right here, the glass cooling coil for taking out heat. And we see a mock-up of the cathode assembly, which would normally be a piece of palladium metal wrapped around with an anode of uh, platinum wire. And we have various sensors thermometers, uh, th uh, thermocouples to measure the various parameters that we need to d determine how much heat is being put out by the cell. How many different structures do we now have for producing uh, this heat? Those it's now been done in heavy water, as we said. It's been done in light water. It's also been done and seen in gas phase, that is, with thin films of palladium in which deuterium has been impressed by gas pressure or some other pressure. And those things, those gas phase reactions are very interesting too because they have a tremendous potential for very high temperatures. Not the millions of degrees of hot fusion, but thousands of degrees centigrade. What would be the advantage <coughs> of a gas fusion system? A gas coal fusion system would not require liquids. Another thing that's would, just been discovered... Would it, be under, would, would it be under high pressure? It could be under high pressure, and it could produce very hot gas. You might think of that as more appropriate to aircraft engines, for example, or for um, uh, uh, high power applications, basically. As a matter of fact, we're talking about uh, using the water for energy. Right. To what temperature would you have to bring the water? Well, for home heating purposes, which I think will be the first application, the first practical application that we will see within the next few years, we'll see prototypes this year, and we'll probably see commercial products in a few years, uh, whatever temperature you need the water to be at, you can have it at. Pons and Fleischmann have got boiling cells already, reproducible boiling cells. Because I, I, I take, for example, um, in a, the average home, there are hot water systems. They're actually very inexpensive hot water heaters. Yes. Uh, relatively exp inexpensive. They use electricity or, or yeah. coal or, or gas. And uh, they don't bring the, uh, water, the, the heating uh, part to boiling temperatures. No, not at all. 